Welcome to the Graduate Job Podcast, your home for weekly information and inspiration to help you get the graduate job of your dreams. Welcome back to the Graduate Job Podcast with your host, James Curran. The Graduate Job Podcast is your weekly home for all things related to helping you on your journey to finding that amazing job. Each week I bring together the best minds in the industry, speaking to leading authors, entrepreneurs, coaches and bloggers who bring decades of experience into a bite-sized weekly 30-minute show. Put simply, this is a show I wish I had a decade ago when I graduated. In episode 33, I speak with author Inga Woodstra as we explore issues of gender and recruitment. We cover a wide range of topics, from the role that gender plays in how and why people apply for graduate jobs, whether women in particular should change their approach to succeed in the recruitment process through to the most effective way to ask for a pay rise. Male or female, this is an episode you're not going to want to miss. As always, all links to everything we discuss and a full transcript are available in the show notes at graduatejobpodcast.com slash gender. Before we start, don't forget that I love to hear your feedback, so do get in touch either by email or Twitter. On Twitter, I'm at gradjobpodcast, and email is hello at graduatejobpodcast.com. What you love, people or companies you'd like to see in the show, I'd love to hear your thoughts, so send them all my way. But now, without further ado, let's jump feet first into episode 33. Very pleased today to be joined by Inga Woodstra, author of the new book Be Gender Smart, founder of W2O Consulting, and also the web portal Mum and Career. Inga, welcome to the Graduate Job Podcast. Oh, hello, James. Good to hear your voice again. So before we start on the topic of gender and careers and recruitment, uh, would you like to introduce yourself properly and tell us a little bit more about how you came to write the book Gender Smart? Well, I started running my own business about six years ago, working with women and women returning to work. And I have a background in business management. So I went to university in the Netherlands. I'm Dutch, did business management there then worked in companies like Siemens and Shell as a consultant in change management and training. And from that, I ended up uh, starting my own training business, uh, training women returning to work. Excellent. And as I mentioned, we're going to delve today into our new book and uh, look at uh, recruitment and job choices through the lens of gender. Um, So starting at the beginning, uh, women are told often that they can do anything that men can do and vice versa. Uh, but what does the research suggest with regard to differences between the sexes? Well, you're saying that right. The research does say we can take the same roles. Man can be just as good a parent as women can, and women can be just as good a CEO as man can, and we do achieve the same results. But it doesn't mean we are the same. And often it means we will take a different route to get to those results. And that's where gender differences come into play. And as I mentioned, we're going to think about this in light of um, recruitment. How do these differences manifest themselves with regard to how women and men might apply for jobs? Well, just to take one difference, right? Men and women compete in different ways. So men compete on status, being the biggest, being the best, whereas women tend to compete on being the nicest, having a good relationship. So for women, it's all about that relationship. For men, it's all about being the best. So then when you have to apply for a job, it tends to be slightly harder for women because in a job, it is all about presenting yourself as someone who is absolutely the best, which for women feels rather insecure and unsafe because it may somehow not be very good for your relationship with the person you're applying for. So women have an extra barrier there in the way, um, yeah, when they're job hunting. And I think that's a, that's a really good point. Generally when I come across CVs and application forms, so, you know, a CV is the, the one time when you need to shout from the rooftops about your achievements. And I often find that people tend to downplay their achievements or they, they aren't explicit enough about you know, what it is that they did and the results that they that came across. So would this be one of the areas where women might you know, tend to hide uh, behind, behind a bushel? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, women feel a bit shy of speaking up about those achievements. Gosh, we work with a team. So basically the team did it, you did, but you need to 
But then at the moment, it is about focusing on what's important for that employer. And I think if you take that mindset as a woman, it works very well. So put your set and women tend to be better at putting themselves in the shoes of others um, because they, their empathy system works very different in the brain. So they have more of that other focus. Put yourself in the shoe of the person hiring and think, well, what will help them? And what will help them is to know what can you achieve? What, they're not hiring your team, they're hiring you. So they want to know what did you achieve? They want, so you need to talk about I did this and then we achieved that. Don't say we achieved that, say, and then I achieved this. This is what I achieved with the team. This is how I got the team involved. This is what I got the team to do. So you can talk about the team, but you talk about your own achievements within that. I think that's a great point. And uh, there's the oft quoted uh, Hewlett Packard internal report, which said that. Uh, Men apply for a job when they meet only 60% of the qualifications, but women apply if they meet 100% of them. Why might this be the case then for that, for that difference in uh, belief in, in putting themselves forward? Yeah, it's actually not really a true piece of research, but it, I mean, it's, it's sort of clearly it's sort of, it hasn't happened the way it did. It's cited a lot, but when you look back at what HP actually did, this doesn't, it's not the outcome of what they said. That said, I think it's a valid thing. Men do tend to, we all recognise it, that men do tend to go for jobs that they're not even half qualified for. So I think as a woman, you just need to be aware that organisations are designed for men and there are the processes in organisations, recruitment processes too, are designed for men. So they work really well. They are sort of geared towards men. So if someone says, this is a fantastic job, we are only going to hire the best of the best, that is something that tends to really enthuse men. They're thinking, oh, yeah, I'm the best of the best. I'm going to apply. But it's something that puts, tends to put a lot of women a bit off. Oh, I'm not sure if I'm the best of the best. So to keep that in mind, you know, this is designed for man. This is speaking to man. And translate that in your own mind and say what they're actually saying. We're looking at someone who's really passionate <laughs> and we're looking at someone who can do this job. So it's almost like having a filter for words like that and knowing it's written for man. We talked just before we start recording about the need for people to be authentic in, in how they apply for jobs. Do you think it's a case then that women need to, as you said, if the recruitment process is geared towards men, should women then almost adopt some of the male characteristics, especially as they get through to the later stages, so assessment centres or interviews, or do they need to just be more authentic to who they are in terms of how they might uh, deal with situations? Yeah, I think that is a really good question because I think it's sort of what women have done traditionally in the past, so let's say since the 1960s when they came into job roles, they looked around, realised their way of working didn't work, and then adapted to what men do. And I'm actually trying to encourage women to be more authentic, um, to actually find ways uh, to work from your own strength. So, for instance, women, because they compete on being nice, have this focus on relationships, tend to be, have a focus on others, put themselves in other shoes, they're actually really good at creating buy-in. So women ask more questions. They are more about, okay, I have this idea. What do you think? Now, in a job interview, that isn't necessarily a brilliant skill, so you need to then find a way, because you're presenting yourself, you're not asking questions, you're not creating buy-in, but you can build relationships. So to think of what can you do with your strength in that job interview, rather than just following what man do. Because um, we were reading through the book, and I was thinking specifically with regard to group exercises, um, which form a big part of lots of the big uh, graduate schemes. So group exercise, maybe six to eight of you, um, you're given a task, you have a short period of time, maybe 45 minutes to, to read a brief, then to come to a consensus uh, amongst a group and to then recommend a course of action. And it's interesting when I've been uh, assessing uh, group exercises, you know, you're, you're looking at the, you have some criteria, you're looking at, um, you know, you're looking at the, the dynamics of the group, who are the people who are speaking, who's um, who's bringing other people into into the conversation, who's putting forward good ideas, you know, who's timekeeping or who's doing the uh, keeping notes, etc. So there's lots of different aspects. And uh, having read the book, it then uh, came to my mind that, you know, some of them were more masculine 
traits and some of them were more you know more feminine traits yeah. uh, which is uh, the consensus in the buy-in yeah. thinking in that example how can women maybe um stand out uh and stand out authentically without the need to yeah that's right i see what you're saying what what does that mean for women if you do have a style that is more focused on relationship building and consensus building that is focused on asking questions getting other people involved if that if that is your style rather than a more commanding style where you present an idea and expect others to buy into it um which tends to be more of a male style you're going to be less visible and you're going to be less visible as a leader you're facilitating that discussion you're an important part of the team process an important part of the team process but it may not always be visible that that was your influence so what you then need to do is before or after in the job interview describe your way of working say gosh yeah when i worked um let's say in the in the newspaper for university I gave leadership by building consensus, give some examples of how you do that. So you need to already be aware of how you work as a woman and then be able to talk about that and talk about how that brings results. So if that's the case, the interviewers will be looking for supportive evidence. I mean, these um, group exercises are not standalone things. So the group exercise is linked to what you've been saying about yourself. So if you say, this is how I work, hey, I actually focus on consensus building or I focus on seeing the big picture so I tend to ask a lot of questions in the beginning because women have more connections in their brain than men so because you have this more connections in your brain you're often seeing impact and consequences that men aren't seeing men tend to be more focused they have more separate compartments in their brain where things are processed so within that separate compartment they can either it's easier for them to keep the discussion on one topic and then, oh gosh, women bring up another thing. But actually that thing might be very important. So one, do you bring it up, the things that you see that others don't think is important? And two, frame it so that others can see it. So don't say, oh gosh, I have another question, but link it to what other people are, other people's priorities. So if someone in a team discussion says, yeah, we need to make sure we deliver in time, say yes, and in order to deliver in time, I have a question. It's key to me to deliver this in time, but we also need to keep the client happy. And then come with your suggestion about how to keep the client happy, even though it isn't linked to time. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, and uh, I think it's a, it's a really good point. And it's linked to something which we've uh, discussed often on the podcast, which is before you start applying for jobs and you know, at the front end of your job search, you need to be very clear and have that self-awareness around what your values are and what your strengths are and as part of this as you mentioned there is you know what are your ways of working how do you how do you naturally w start working in different situations and if you can go into an interview and you know when when you're discussing different aspects uh, in the interview you can you can talk about well actually you know i tend to find that i work very well in this situation or i have these uh, these particular strengths um it will certainly make you stand out uh, above the crowd because most people just don't think about this yeah, I think that is, yeah, that is right. And especially, I think, for women, because their way of working tends to be a bit less visible. So they need to talk about it more. You mentioned earlier that workplaces are designed uh, by men for men. Could you expand upon this and, and what you mean by it? Well, basically, organ yeah, man used to work. Out when work outside the house was created, it was man doing it. Um, offices, um, more graduate types jobs, have been done by men for many decades and um, yeah so naturally almost or every the way things work in organizations is focused on what works for man and what works for man is remember how they compete on um, being the biggest and the best so in organizations that's fine because it's all about competition for man it's important um, what well, is a psychological thing men find their security being at the top you know when they're at the top, no one can attack me. Oh, I'm safe. Women find security in their friendships. When I'm friends with someone, I know no one's going to attack me, so I feel safe. So in an organization, it is all about then, about status and hierarchy, about being able to feel at the top. There's rewards. It's about winning. We're, we talk about the war for talent. The, we are competing with our... We are, having battles with our competitors that we need to win this is all language that really ties into how man feels safe and how man can teach 
So looking ahead then to starting work and the world of work, what are some of the common issues that women face when they when they start working in a tend to be a large employer? Yeah, I, I sort of hate to say that women have issues. I'd say employers have issues. Um, <laughs> that's, that's a good uh, good I challenge. Mean, in the end, I think employers need to be more aware of how women work and the talents that women bring. But I think as a woman, it's important. I think it's important you don't emulate. There's two things actually. I think you need to do is don't emulate the man around you, but look how women do things, and observe how this world works. You know, I like this. Um, where I say organisations are designed for man, and then if you ask women to be successful in those organisations, it's like asking a fish to climb a tree. So here you are, this fish. Just watch how they climb trees. Watch what it's like in the jungle, so you know what works for them. So, for instance, when men take decisions, they, and I mean, this is all, I mean, I describe it in more detail in the book, but I'm summarizing it here quite crudely. But they tend to focus on things like data, facts, you know, graphs, pictures, images. So when women tend to have a very different style of gathering information for a decision, they, they ask other people, oh, what have you done before? Which is basically gathering best practices. Um, what happened in the history, how did other people do that, so it's more about people and gathering opinions, and then they take a decision. But when you're talking to, a, so when you're in an organisation and you're talking to a man, I think it's important to make sure that you're being heard, so you want to give short answers, which helps men with their focus, you want to talk about numbers and about results. So you tie in to that data focus, and when you, so rather than saying, oh, I'm going to just have a chat with some people, find out what they did. You say, I'm collecting data to find vital evidence so we can take a decision. So it's really just about framing it so man can hear what you're doing. So careful use of language to push the buttons of... Uh, the man that you work with, yeah. Speaking to friends and asking them, questions that they'd like to see covered on this uh, on this podcast. Um, so when I spoke to my female friends, the question that they wanted asking was pay. Yeah. Pay and how to have the conversation around getting a pay rise because it was something that they found very difficult and challenging. They wanted to know the best ways to have that conversation with their male bosses. Yeah, it's interesting because it is something... See, women are, from a very young age, men grow up with that sort of competing on being the biggest and the best. So three-year-old boys are already boasting on the playground, look at me being brilliant, and you know what? My dad's got a bigger car than your dad. So that sort of stuff. Boys do that all the time. Uh, and when girls try and do that same thing, other girls will not accept that. You're instantly out of the group because you're competing on being nice, and it's not very nice to say you're better than someone else. So by the time men enter the workforce, they've honed that as a very fine skill. You know, my 10-year-old no longer talks like that. He now very subtly drops, and he's a boy, right? So he now very subtly drops things in the conversation that make it sound like he's very good. Um, but it's not so boasting. He knows it's not allowed, and the teachers won't really look favorably on it. So he's learned not to boast, but still people will know he's absolutely brilliant and his dad does have a bigger car, you know? <laughs> so by the time women enter the workforce, they haven't had that 20 years of practice of how to really sound like you're great, but not both. So then women go and negotiate and they, they do it, tend to do it too bluntly. They're going to sort of, they come in, one of the male manager who hires people regularly said, then they come in and they say, well, this is what I've got to earn, and I've got three other offers, and I'm going to go for those if you don't give me this money. Which is then, for the person on the other side of the table, not very nice, whereas men do it very differently. Men go, gosh, I've uh, got this fantastic background. I've done these three other projects uh, where I achieved really great results, so I expect that that, that will be reflected in the pay package. And that then gives the employer... Yeah, some advantages. So for a woman, when she negotiates, I love what um, Sheryl Sandberg said on this. Also, when a woman negotiates, it's also viewed differently because we expect different things from men and women. So women are often, when they do say, yeah, this is what I expect, they're instantly seen as a bitch. So the advice Sheryl Sandberg gives, and I think that would work very well, is to then frame it slightly different, say some, link it to other people, link it to teams, so say, 
Gosh, yeah, obviously um, it's very important for my entire team um, that we charge enough, so that's why um, I need to now charge you more for this project so the team's efforts are reflected. Another way of doing it is saying, well, women are always taught to negotiate, so obviously, <laughs> and I'm a feminist, so I want to be on that side, so I'd love to do a bit of negotiation here. So find a way so you can frame it or link it to something external. I think for women also, they hesitate about putting themselves forward because that psychological factor of not wanting to put yourself forward and competing, losing those relationships, not feeling safe when you don't have your friends around anymore is such an important psychological thing that it's hard to ask for something. And I think then it's important again to put yourself in someone else's shoes because your boss wants to pay you more. Also, you're in this jungle, remember? You're climbing a tree. Everyone else is going to be judging you on how much you earn. So maybe you don't need that money, but it's going to tell other people what you are worth. So I personally thought it wasn't very important to me money. I never negotiated about anything. But then I looked for other jobs, and instantly they would ask, so what level are you at now? And I said, oh, yeah, I'm at a medium, uh, medium consultant level. Um, and then they'd see my pay and they'd be like, oh, wow, that's more what the juniors get here. So we assume you do more of a junior job. So my qualities, my output was linked to that pay package. People didn't look at, oh, she's done some really interesting projects. They look at how much has she paid, been paid. And once I knew that, I thought, okay, pay is not important to me, but other people judge how good I do my work on how much I'm paid. And once you know that, I think, yeah, pay is important to you. <laughs> No, that's a really, it's a really interesting way of putting it. No, that's a good point. So, everyone listening, just uh, go out there, be confident, and um, ask a question. So, thinking Inga around some uh, practical tools that uh, women can use to to help them both in recruitment and once they get into the workplace, would you recommend uh, joining, say, networking groups and uh, women in business uh, groups and things like that? Oh, thanks for that question, James. Because absolutely, yeah. I think especially because. Um, there's this research with head teachers, which I love in the Netherlands, where they, um, yeah, women, when they're out of that group of friends, so when, for instance, when they get promoted, they feel quite insecure. So men feel safe, they're on top of the world, no one will attack them. They tend to sort of enjoy being in charge because of that. It gives them a safe feeling. For women, it's the opposite. They've now left the team, they're no longer a teacher, they're the head teacher. And they gave these head teachers a group of peers and in that group of peers, these hat teachers could talk about the tensions they have, the issues they have, and they find a lot of recognition. And that really gave them confidence. Oh, other people have these issues too. Now I'm getting confident. Okay, so it's okay to have those issues. Hey, and I'm solving them. Look, and then you get new ideas of how to solve them. You just have a place to bend those emotions and knowing there's a people there that listen and that aren't going to judge you as a bad head teacher just because you need to bend something. And women have, need that sort of place to feel secure. Men need to bend somewhere too, but they tend to find it with one woman in their life, let's say their mum or their partner, and they will absolutely not ever share that with their friends or at work at all, uh, because that wouldn't be safe. It'd be about losing faith, which would be horrid. So for women, you need to be careful not to do that at work. And when you're then, obviously, when you're yeah, looking for jobs, I think it's very important to find safe places to do that. So maybe find someone else who's looking for a job, find a sparring partner that you can work with, um, find a coach or a mentor, or find a group of other people that are also looking for jobs. I think that's important. That's the security part. Then if you're networking to find a job, see that as something different. So when you're out there looking for jobs and sort of building relationships, then it's about the job and it isn't about all these things that you can't do, the bad experiences you had, then you're selling yourself and you do need to um, talk about what you're good at, what you've achieved, what kind of job you'd like and what your ambitions are. So there's basically two types of networking that women need to do, whereas men tend to do the one type of networking. Oh, that's brilliant advice and uh, yeah, I've not thought about keeping them separate but it makes um makes complete sense yeah it's in your it's, it's helpful if you keep it separate in your mind so you do need a group where you can vent online or in real life or somewhere but you also need groups where you're actually yeah actively putting yourself forward as someone who can do good, the job well 
and uh, through the internet through sites like uh, Meetup. Um, it's really easy to set up and find groups and also to set up your own. Yeah, 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 that would be that. Yeah, set up your own. That's why I often recommend women. There must be a lot of other women out there in the area that are also looking for jobs. So set up your own, yeah. And obviously that can lead to jobs, but I think you need to sort of separate the two so you know you're doing something that is effective. Yep. You don't think, gosh, I'm only chatting in that group, so really I'm, I'm not, my job's not going to come from there. Let's no longer go there. Actually, it's tends to be very important for confidence and inspiration. Inga, unfortunately, time is running away with us. But before we finish, uh, let's move on to our quick fire question round, which I ask each of my guests. Right. <laughs> so first off, what one book would you recommend our listeners to read? Well, so could I say my own book? <laughs> you certainly can. So Be Gender Smart, The Key to Career Success. I think it, it really helps women that are starting out in their career to understand to help them look at that jungle, look at that tree, and, and really get a head start, knowing how they should act. Excellent. And um, I've read the book, really recommend it, and I'll, it's all be linked to in the show notes. So check out the show notes at graduatejobpodcast.com, and you'll find a link straight to the book. And Inga, what one website would you recommend that our listeners visit? Yes, yeah, it's a long time ago I looked for a job last. So, I mean, I've been, I think it's what, I think it's news about the organisation you're, um, you're going to apply for, really follow them in the news and make sure what's happened just in the week before your job interview, make sure what's happening so you can link to that. That's great advice. There's uh, nothing more powerful than walking into the interview knowing everything about the company and knowing about their latest, whether it's share price movement or yeah. you know new CEO or new products they've launched. Uh, it really stands you in good stead. Yeah, and especially if some internal things are going on, like they're just being taken over by another company, or which often happens just the week you're being interviewed, or if there is a big deal coming up and they've just done really well. Women tend to be um, to see and hear different things from men. So women pick up a lot of signals and that can make you really insecure in a job interview because you're thinking this is all about you. But actually, a lot of it can be about what's happening outside of you and in that person's mind. So let that go. This, what, the, what you're seeing and feeling in an interview may not be about you. That's a good point. And finally, what one tip would you give that our listeners can implement today on their job hunt? Yeah, I think it is about being being really aware of how you work and how you achieve results so you can talk about that. So how do you lead? What do you do to get people where you want them to go? Why do people listen to you? How do you get them to listen to you? And how do you get, yeah, how do you convince people of your ideas? How do you create followers? And to be really aware of your own behavior there so you can really confidently talk about that. Completely echo that. Self-awareness of your, your skills and your strengths will take you a long, long way. Yeah. Inga, before we finish, what is the best way for people to get in touch with you and the work that you do? Uh, probably via the book website, because the book website, is, uh, it's called Be Gender Smart, and it's got all my details on, and then people can just send me an email. You can find me on Twitter as well. or um, Should I name that, or are you going to put that on your website? I, I can link to that as well on the, uh, on the And website. anyone who chats to me on Twitter I'll happily chat back with as well Perfect Inga thank you very much for your time today and appearing on the Graduate Job Podcast Okay thank you and to all the women out there I'd say you can do it just go for it because we really need you at the top Many thanks to Inga for her time there Three things stood out for me from our chat which are applicable across the sexes The first was a point linked to the issue of different male and female characteristics in the recruitment process do you like to dominate the conversation? Do you like to build consensus and buy-in? How do you lead people? How do you come to decisions? It all boils down to thinking about yourself, your strengths and characteristics, because ultimately you need to know yourself. As Aristotle said, knowing yourself is the beginning of all wisdom. If you can walk into that interview and talk about your strengths and weaknesses honestly, or how you like to work, or how you get people to come to a decision, you will stand head and shoulders above all the other applicants. Now you might be thinking, but I don't have a job, how can I think about these things? But think about maybe yourself at group exercise at university, working in part-time jobs, dealing with friends or difficult situations. The difficult part is just sitting down to think about it. Take the time and do it now. You won't regret it. 
The second takeaway for me is on understanding the impact of the language you use and having an awareness that it's going to impact people in different ways. I had training years ago from a brilliant trainer called Gareth Bunn who described communication as an event in the other person's mind. What he meant was, you might think you are communicating something clearly. You might think that you've definitely got it across and the person has definitely understood it. How could they not? But unless the person listening is understanding it in the way you intended, your communication might not have been successful. As Inga said, with the example of talking to a male boss, to communicate effectively to them, you might have to be shorter and sharper in the words and sentences you use. Give them figures and data, which you might not be used to doing. This might not be your preferred, normal style of communicating. As Chris Delaney talked about in episode 28, the language you use and the way you use it impacts massively on how you can build rapport. So think about the person you're talking to and think about what is going to be the best way for you to get your message across to them. Because in an interview situation, this can make all the difference between being a yes or being a no. And finally, I love Dinger's point about finding that network who can help you on your job search be it for support, but also for networking. Now, networking groups are a massively underutilized approach for graduate job seekers. Lots of people find them daunting, which is exactly why you should be using them. Listen to my interview with Brad Burton and also Stefan Thomas for hints on how you can network effectively. And do look at sites such as meetup.com. There are hundreds, literally hundreds of women in business or career groups on them. If there isn't one in your area, start one. You never know where it will lead. And if you do start one, let me know and I'll publicise it on the show. So there you go. Episode 33 finished. If you've enjoyed the show, let me know on Twitter. My handle is at gradjobpodcast or email me hello at graduatejobpodcast.com. And please do leave a review and subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher Radio. As I say, every week it's the best way other than sharing us with your friends to show appreciation for the podcast. And it helps massively in the rankings. So it means that other people can easily find us. Do join me next week when I have a fascinating guest, former cleaner turned bouncer, turned BAFTA award-winning author and filmmaker Jeff Thompson, as we go deep and examine what fears might be holding you back in your job search. You're not going to want to miss that one. Now, I hope you enjoyed the episode today, but more importantly, I hope you use it and apply it. See you next week. <laughs>